There is nothing better than a loved one's presence. A card sent in the mail is nice, but it doesn't compare. A bouquet of flowers delivered on a special occasion is heartwarming, but it can't compete. A live chat over Facebook or FaceTime or whatever app or piece of technology you prefer is really, really great. But it would be lying to say that a chat over a screen was as good as real presence. Nothing compares to when mom comes to stay. Nothing compares to when you and your bestie meet up for a few days of travel together. Nothing compares to an actual hug, an actual face-to-face conversation, an actual cup of coffee shared on your actual couch. I am an absolute sucker. And by that I mean I get really tearful uh, when those airport scenes happen in movies. One of my favorites is in the movie Love Actually. It's a Christmas movie that gives these snapshots of all sorts of different kinds of relationships. There are some tense experiences and some funny experiences. There are heartbreaking moments and some truly joy-filled moments. But all of the relationships with all of their ups and downs come together at the end of the movie in the airport. There's a crowd of people at the arrivals gate milling about standing around, shuffling their feet, waiting. All of a sudden, the sound of suitcase wheels gets louder and louder, and then the doors slide open, and everyone, the people waiting and the arriving travelers alike, all eagerly scan for a familiar face. Then that special moment happens, right? Eye contact is made between loved ones. Faces soften into big, old smiles. Kisses are exchanged, or hugs, or handshakes, or high fives, or whatever. It's all in celebration of the same truth. Distance is no more. Presence is experienced, and presence is such a gift. Just ask someone who has lost a loved one. You've got your memories, sure, you've got your photo albums, of course. But the comfort of those precious things doesn't come close to soothing the ache of the loss of that person's actual presence. That's what you miss, right? Their presence. That's what you long for. Their presence. Just be home again. Just be driving around town with me again. Just be at the dinner table again. Just be here. The airport scene is so great, and death is so horrible, because both touch on that same thing that every human being knows. Presence is such a gift. Nothing compares. Now, if we want to understand who the Holy Spirit is, That right there is the key. The concept of presence. Real presence. The coming of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of God's promise to give his presence to his people. The coming of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of God's promise to come to be with, to be present to his loved ones. He's the smile of God at the arrivals gate. He's the hug of God in the airport lobby. And he is the experience of God coming to stay. The Holy Spirit is the real, actual presence of the living God with us and in us. If you had a highlighter and you took it to a Bible, you could trace the idea of the presence of God as a theme connecting the whole thing from cover to cover, right from beginning to end. 
The opening of the Bible, the opening scene of the Bible, is the Garden of Eden. And it is not just a place God creates and watches from a distance. No, it's a place where God dwells very closely and intimately with Adam and Eve. He is truly present with them. And then the closing scene of the Bible is a vision that the first Christians were given of the end of time. The picture is of a completely restored earth in which all sin is cleansed, all brokenness is healed, and God is dwelling just like in Eden with human beings again. The presence of God with people literally, literally bookends the Bible, like first chapter to last. In Genesis, after the Eden scene, we have a scene often called the fall into sin. And this scene depicts this moment where human beings are deceived, mistrust God, and in pride disobey his will. It's not only a moment in time, but it represents and explains the human condition. And the heart of the tragedy of the fall is the loss of God's presence. Adam and Eve were banished from Eden. Human pride and sin made it impossible for God and humans to dwell together peaceably, and we were separated from our Creator and our Father. But then, and I'm just taking the highlighter and I'm just like literally tracing this line for us this morning right through the Bible, then in the book of Exodus, God graciously makes provisions to be present with his people again. God shows up in a burning bush. He gives his presence to Moses, and then he brings the Israelites out of Egypt through the Red Sea and to Mount Sinai, where he is present to them in all of his power and glory. You see, God really, really wants to be present with his people. He really wants to dwell with them. So there at Sinai, he gives them these laws to follow and specific instructions to set up a tabernacle or a tent for him to live in. And then when everything is ready, the presence of God descends in the form of a cloud into the tabernacle. It's amazing. And it is an undeserved gift. Later on, The people of Israel become more established, and under the leadership of David and then Solomon, a temple is built, a permanent home for the presence of God. The temple became the place for worship, the place for prayer, and the heart of the people's national identity. Now, the temple wasn't so special in Israel because it was beautiful, even though it was. It was special Because that's where the presence of their God was. And you know, Israel had all of these laws and customs and cleanliness rituals and animals to sacrifice. Just read Leviticus. You'll see it all there. But those things weren't the things that actually defined them. They understood themselves as defined by the presence of God. All of their laws, all of their customs were done in service of maintaining relationship with the God who had graciously given them his presence. They loved the law. They loved the law because it enabled them to enjoy God's presence. They loved the temple. They just loved the temple because it was the place where God's presence was most concentrated. A trip to the temple for God's people was like a trip to the airport to pick up a long-awaited loved one. It was like the eye contact and the smile and that special hug. Psalm 84 says this, and you can just kind of get a taste of that, that love they had for the temple and the presence of God. How lovely is your dwelling place. O Lord Almighty, my soul longs, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. 
The person singing this psalm is basically saying, I envy the priests who get to live and work in the temple continuously. I envy the airport employees who get to spend their days on the front line in the sweet spot at the gate of your presence. But you all know how the story continues to unfold, right? Israel fails to live up to the terms of God's good law. And as a result, they forfeit God's presence. Israel is conquered by Babylon. The temple is destroyed. And the majority of the people are taken to live in exile far, far away. You've got to understand the gift of presence, or you've got to know the pain of its loss to grasp how devastating this was. It was like a death to them. It was like God's presence was once there. Like there was companionship, there was communion, and then he was gone. They were alone. The house was empty. I imagine the little old ladies who were left behind after the battle, too old and weak to be taken as captives, sitting in the rubble of their beloved temple, weeping, 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 weeping like the only people left at the gate of the airport, painfully aware that their loved one wasn't there and wouldn't be coming no matter how long they waited or how hard they cried. It was sad. It was a sad season in the life of the people of Israel. But all was not lost. Don't forget where we are headed to a picture of God Dwelling with humanity in a renewed, restored world. Don't forget the crazy thing is that God really, really, as I already said, wants to be present to his people and with his people. So these promises start cropping up in the words and in the writings of the prophets The very same prophets that warned the people that God would absolutely take his presence away from them if they didn't repent, they begin to to speak messages of hope, saying, you know, one day God is going to establish a new relationship with you. One day he's going to forgive you. One day he's going to revive you. One day he's going to give you his presence again. Go ahead and take that highlighter that you're using to connect these dots through Scripture and mark Ezekiel 36 and 37. Here are the words, and this is just an example of one of the promises that we get in the prophets about God's presence. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. It's the promise of a new relationship marked by the return of God's presence, or in other words, the giving of God's own spirit. Bring that highlighter forward now and draw a big old circle around Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is how God instituted this new relationship. Jesus Christ lived a life that fulfilled the law perfectly and obeyed the Father in every way. And Jesus Christ died a cruel death, taking the judgment that sinful humanity deserved 
an enduring on the cross separation from God. And he did that so that God's people wouldn't have to. And when he did, the Bible says, the curtain in the temple, that big old curtain that was separating the place of God's presence from the rest of the building was torn in two. It was no longer needed, of course. The sin that caused us to forfeit the gift of God's presence had been dealt with, was atoned for. Last week, together, we celebrated the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ not only died, but rose from the dead victorious. And this morning, we read that our risen Lord said to his disciples shortly before ascending into heaven, Now wait for the gift my father promised. Wait for the gift my father has promised. Which is a reference to the spirit, to the promised coming of the presence of God. And of course, Jesus refers to the spirit as someone who has been promised. It has been promised since way, way back. It's a promise God's people heard from their prophets. But it's also a promise, a hope, a dream that each and every human has carried since Eden. Because it's the thing we long for. It's the thing we were created for. The presence, the very presence of God. And with sin atoned for by Christ on the cross, there ain't nothing holding our God back from doing that thing that he's always really, really wanted to do. Which is to give his presence to his people. And so that's what he does. On the day of Pentecost, God poured out his spirit to be on and in and with his people. God continued to give his spirit to his people throughout the New Testament. And it's what God continues to do, I'm telling you. Each and every day, when more and more of his children hear the gospel, repent of their sin, and find forgiveness through the death of Jesus Christ, he gives his spirit. He gives his presence. Here he comes. There He is striding through those doors at the arrival gate again and again and again to give a hug and to come to stay with each and every one of his children, each and every one of his loved ones. When the Apostle Paul writes later now towards the end of our Bible, when the Apostle Paul writes to the first Christians teaching them about who they are as individuals, like, like who are they? How are they supposed to understand themselves? He writes, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And when the Apostle Paul teaches who Christians are corporately as a group, he writes, in Christ, the whole building, he's referring to the group of Christians, the church, in Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You and I are temples of God's presence. We together are his dwelling place. The language here is not a coincidence. And it is not an accident. The temple is totally the place where Israel understood God's presence to be and where they expected it to be. But under the new relationship established by God, brought about by Jesus Christ, God gives his spirit to live with and be in each and every individual believer. And in the gathered community of the local church. The psalmist, King David, 
looked at the temple and he said, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. That's what he said. How lovely. But because of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we look at each other and we look in the mirror and we say, how lovely, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. His presence isn't just some place over there. It's here. And I'm looking at it. And it's a beautiful view. And I am it. As a child of the living God by Christ. And so are you. We together are the place of God's very presence. Me and you. The very presence that walked with Adam and Eve in Eden the very presence that parted the Red Sea, the very presence that came in power on Mount Sinai, the very presence that descended in glory into the tabernacle and temple, the very presence that filled Jesus Christ the Son for his work on earth, the very presence that was poured out on the first disciples on that first Pentecost, the very presence of the God that is on mission to restore the world so that he could dwell with humanity fully and forever. That very presence is in you and with you. Back to the airport scene for a minute. I am looking forward to living the airport scene in a few weeks because my mother is coming to town. Which, you know, deep anticipation... (laughs) for her help and presence. As we've already established, FaceTime chats don't compare to real presence. They don't. But here's the thing about my mom. When she comes to be present with me, she isn't only present with me. She doesn't just come to my house and like hang out in the corner like, oh, how, how nice to have my mom's presence. No, 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 no. She gets to work. She really does. She helps me clean my house. She helps me fold my laundry. Believe me, there's tons. She cooks me good food. She talks to me. She gives me advice. And she comes with me as I go out and about doing what I need to do. And that's what the presence of the Holy Spirit is like. The Spirit is not just something nice to look at or or think about kind of like in the corner of your life. Like, oh, how nice. I like believe the presence of God is with me. I can sort of admire the idea of it. No! No! No, 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 no. The Spirit is a real, living, spiritual being. He's active. And he's got specific things to do. And you better believe he's doing them. The rest of this sermon series, which I'm so excited about, by the way, is going to be a study on each of the main activities of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us new life, brings about our rebirth into God's kingdom. The Holy Spirit makes us holy, transforming us into the image of Jesus. The Holy Spirit empowers us for our work in the world. And the Holy Spirit builds the Christian community, unifying Christians in love and in service. In short, the Holy Spirit takes 
all that Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection 2,000 years ago and applies it to our own hearts and into our own lives. But we'll get to all that in the coming weeks. Today, let's sit with that bigger, broader, simpler truth. God is with you. God dwells in you. He created you. He loved you. He loved you so much. He made a way to be with you through Jesus Christ. And then he gave you his presence. So you see, you're not alone. I don't know what all your lives are like right now. But you are not alone. You are not living and working and eating and sleeping. Just you. It's you and him. You are together. You are connected. You are in communion. You have his affection. You have his attention. You have his abiding companionship. God really, really wants to give his presence to his loved ones. To you, his beloved. And he has given himself to you. Do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty.